divine occupation. Um, there's a unique difference between a job and a career. Um, say that again, there's a unique difference between what we call a job and what we call a career. Um, a job is simply a means to an end, and it's typically temporary, whereas a career and occupation instills purpose and longevity. A job is something that you have simply just to pay the bills, uh, to make sure that you're able to put food on the table, able to take care of the basic necessities of life. A career, again, it's meant to be long-term. It's meant to serve a purpose. One uh, likens a career to a calling of sorts. It's something that you know not only that you're good at doing, but it's something, that, dare I say, that you're destined to do. Uh, and so, again, one is called to not simply to have a job, but one is called to find a career. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with having a job. Sometimes you got to work that job until you get into your career. Somebody say amen when you can. Uh, and, and so it's important, to, uh, even though we have a job, but also to know the difference between the two. Uh, in the realm of the spirit, Christians are called to possess the correct mindset in both our earthly and spiritual employment. Somebody say amen when you can. Our text in Matthew 4 highlights Jesus in the early stages of his public ministry. And in its inception, Christ commissions four fishermen into the apostleship that were going to soon help him uh, begin the start of the church three years later. From this point in Scripture, the Spirit will emphasize the following principles. The first point that we see in Matthew 4, verses 18 to 20, we see the inconvenience of the occupation. Somebody say inconvenience. Yeah, yeah, the inconvenience of the occupation right here in the text in verse 18 to 20. The Bible says there, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Moving on to verse 19, the Bible says there, Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And the response in verse 20, it says, Then they immediately left their nets and followed him. Is that, is that, is that in your Bibles? Uh, when you look at this text, uh, we see that Peter, James, John, the sons of Zebedee, they, they had a job. Uh, they had an occupation that they were, uh, they were good at. Uh, you'll find that they were great at navigating the sea. When you talk about being a fisherman, uh, being a man of the sea, you have to know what's called the hot spots of the water, know where the fish normally like to, uh, to tear in, know, know where they normally like to labor in. Uh, I, I, I'm not an expert fisherman, but I've done a little thing here or two or there. Uh, when I was a teenager, my brother and I, we would go to, go to Dallas every summer with our extended family there and had an uncle, my Uncle Gary, we would go what we call deep sea fishing. And it's fun to fish off the bank and off the shore, uh, but it's fun to go deep sea fishing. Uh, uh, y y yes, sir, yes, sir. And Brother Woods, you know about that. And so you, in order to go deep sea fishing, the best time to go is not when the sun is out, but you got to wake up in the wee hours of the morning, <laughs> about midnight, 1, 2 o'clock, get out there while the water's still cold, and that's when the fish are ripe for the picking. And so these, these fishermen, these four fishermen, they, they knew the trade. They knew the craft of what it meant to be fishermen. They had a job. They had something that they were good at. But then came a man named Jesus. Uh, saw them and saw their skill set. Saw that they were good navigators of the sea. Saw the craft. Saw that they were experts at what they do. And yes, while they were great fishermen, as the text says, Christ said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, while we know this text very well, there's something simple to point out in this first point. Yes, while they were fishermen, God called them to a greater occupation. 
And, and what I want to point out to is, right, yes, you have your job. You have your earthly calling. But as a Christian, Christ calls us to do more. Don't miss that. Right here in the text in verse 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. What? For they were fishermen. Now, what is inconvenient about this is that Christ did not call men that were idle. Christ did not call men uh, that were lazy. Christ actually called them while they were in the midst of working. Don't miss that, Lord have mercy. So many of us, when it, when it comes time to be about our father's business, we make work the excuse of why we can't serve God and why we can't be about his business. Oh, but when you look in the text, uh, uh, being a child of God, being an apostle, being a disciple, this call was rather inconvenient. And what I'm getting at is that when God or when Christ calls you into this ministry, into this body of believers, it's going to be inconvenient. There's going to be some things that have to be put on the back burner for God. Yes, you have your nine to five. You have your calling, but even your earthly occupation should not stand in the way of your spiritual occupation. Again, Christ did not call people that were idle of that were twiddling their thumbs. These two brothers were busy. They were toiling and they were working. Preacher, what are you getting at? Number one, know that being a child of God, one cannot be idle, one cannot be lazy. One must be willing to get their hands dirty and do the work. I mean, what would it look like if, if, they, if, they, if they were in the midst of labor, but then when it came time to be called into this ministry, they then put down their hands to work and got lazy? What we see is that when God calls you, it's not going to always be convenient. It's going to come at sometimes the most inopportune time in your life. And we have to be uh, Christ-centered to make the decision to say, yes, I have this job. Yes, I have this calling. And while in this earthly life, yes, we're called to make ends meet. But we have to learn to trust God. That when we put him first and seek the kingdom first, even though we're putting him first, God is going to make every eye dotted. God is going to cross every T. And God will make all the crooked paths straight. Somebody say amen when you can. And so one understand, being a child of God, you cannot be lazy. God is calling us to not be people who just sit on the shore, but we're called to get out there in the deep sea and be willing to do some work. Y'all all right? And so again, understand that Christ called them while they were in the midst of work. Your nine to five, your job should not be a reason why you cannot serve God. In fact, we see in verse 19, he says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Look at their response. It says, they immediately left their nets. They clocked out and followed God. What would the church be like if children of God knew how to prioritize their obligations? Yes, your nine to five is important, but Christ has to be priority number one. Notice, secondly, in this point, about the inconvenience. Rather, the convenience was that the call that Christ had commissioned them to, it was in conjunction or in cooperation with what they were already doing. Look at what he said in verse 19. Follow me. I'm going to make you fishers but you're not trying to catch fish anymore. Follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of, in other words, the skill set, the training, uh, the craft that you have mastered, it's going to come into fruition with now this spiritual enterprise. In other words, uh, there is a purpose for your job. There is a purpose for your career. The things that you're doing right now, you may not even like them. 
But know that God has divinely positioned you where he wants you so that when you come into this enterprise called Christianity, the skill set, the trade that you've learned, it will be used even in the ministry. Somebody say amen when you can. And so I don't care if you're a plumber. There's going to be a purpose in using that skill set for the Lord. I don't care if you are a technician. There is a place for that in the kingdom. And so often, many people want the high and lofty position in God, but everybody can't do the same thing. I'm reminded of the parable of the talents. One had one, another had two, and another had five. And God blessed them according to what? Their giftedness. And so learn to appreciate where God has divinely positioned you. Preacher, what are you getting at? Again... The call on your life that God has for you will not come at the perfect time, but it's going to come at the right time. I'm going to say that again. The call that God has for you, it will not come at the perfect time, but it's going to come at the right time. We say all the time, God may not come when you want him, but when he does, he's always right on time. Many have been questioning and discerning within their hearts, what, what is my purpose? What is my mission? What is the objective that I should be seeking after? Even in the midst of your nine to five and trying to get to that earthly career, know that there is a spiritual enterprise that God calls each and every one of us to. Is that all right? So not only do we see the inconvenience of this spiritual occupation, uh, secondly in the text, According to Matthew 4, 21 to 20, we see the importance of the occupation. Somebody say importance. Yeah, yeah, the importance of the occupation. If you're tuning in online, type in that word, importance. Right here in the text, verse 21, the Bible says, going on from there, after he called Peter and Andrew, it says that he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee, their father. Y'all see that there? And the Bible says, much like... Andrew and Peter, they too were working. Why? Because they were mending their nets. It says as he saw them mending their nets, he called them. In verse 22, the Bible says, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Is, is, is that in your Bibles? So not only do we see the inconvenience of this occupation, we're now called to see the importance of the occupation. When you look in the text, after he called the first pair of fishermen, he began to navigate further, and he saw two other brothers, James and John, the son of Zebedee. Much like Peter and Andrew, they too were in the midst of severe labor and work. While Peter and Andrew were casting the nets, uh, uh, you'll see that uh, John and James, they were mending the nets. And in the midst of them mending the net, the text says it's at that point when Jesus called them. And watch this now. Uh, in contrast to, verse, uh, to the earlier text, the Bible says in verse 22, after he called them, the Bible says what? And immediately they left their job and their father. In other words, we see that James and John, they were part of a family business. And so one could see the importance and value of their earthly occupation. But there was something about the call of Christ that was so deep in their hearts and minds that when Jesus called, they immediately left the boat and they left their father's business and followed him. Now, if you're like me, not just as a minister, but just as a Christian, I like to ask the Word of God questions. What was it about Jesus that commissioned them to call? That they didn't wait, they didn't wait till their shift was done, but they immediately left the job and followed God. Careful study of this text, the time and the context and background, you'll find that uh, the wedding of Canaan, which was the first miracle of Christ, amen, when he, Christ turned water into wine. Y'all remember that miracle there? That was the first miracle that Christ performed. This event took place a year before Christ called Peter, James, John, and Andrew. So what we see from the wedding in Cana to this time frame in Matthew 4, again, a year's span of time 
had uh, occurred. Y'all still with me? So in other words, these four fishermen, they were unofficial followers of Christ. I'm going to say that again. For a year, they unofficially followed Christ. Uh, they didn't know him personally, but they knew of his works and what he was doing. And so from the point of when he turned water into wine, and not just any wine, but the best wine that anyone at that wedding party had ever tasted in their life. And so it was at that point that they made the decision, wow, we don't know him personally. We may not know him intimately, but as best as we can, we're going to follow him. And so what we see, for a year, Christ allowed them to be bystanders. But you'll find that the more they followed Christ for a season, for a year, just watch them. And so the closer they got, Jesus, in other words, was saying with this commission and call to this spiritual occupation, Christ is pretty much saying in context, you've been following me for 12 months now. You've seen what I can do. You've heard the, the, the masterful sermons that I preach and the lessons that I taught. And you've been following by the wayside. But now I'm calling you to a closer, more intimate relationship with me. Oh, somebody in the church needs to hear this. Some of us have been following as an innocent bystander. You've seen what God has done for others, and now Christ is saying, I want to draw you in just a little more closer. Yes, you've seen what he's done. You've heard what he's done for others. You've been a, a bystander. You've been an occasional follower. But now Christ is saying, I don't need you to be an occasional follower, but now I need you as a permanent fixture in the ministry. Yeah, it's good to, you know, come to worship here or there. It's good to open your Bible on occasions here or there. Yes, because something is better than nothing. But when you really want to be intimate with God, when you really want to feel all of his goodness, all of his blessings, all that God has to offer, you can't be an occasional disciple. But Christ in the text is teaching you must be a consistent follower of Christ. Is that all right? And so what we see at this point in Scripture is not only was Christ observing them, they also were observing Christ. And because they immediately followed him, the text suggests by necessary inference that they were actually waiting for the opportunity for God to call them. And so the question lies, not will you be consistent in following God, but the question is, are you patiently waiting for God to draw you closer to him? Mm, Lord have mercy. Somebody didn't come in for that this morning, that's okay. Some of us, sadly, are actually comfortable with being an occasional follower of God. But Christ is teaching, if you want the best of the best, if you want all that I have to offer, you're going to have to come just a little bit closer. Uh, we've said before we're in the middle of a pandemic, and yes, the, the live stream technology is indeed a blessing to those who are sick and shut in, to those uh, who are not able to physically attend. Uh, but again, there's something about being close and personal with the worship experience. Uh, hearing the word of God on your technological device is fine, but it's something about opening the page of inspiration for yourself and allowing the word of God to speak to you directly. Yes, you can hear about how the word has blessed other people, but it's something about when you devote intimate and personal time with God, that's when God will truly and genuinely and authentically speak to you. And so obviously we see there was an importance to the call because these four men left the business. They dropped the nine to five. They dropped what they were masterful and good at to follow a calling 
and discipleship that was of such a great importance. As we alluded to previously, uh, one scholar said that while the text says they immediately left their nets and followed him, one scholar put it this way, uh, the men didn't leave their nets, they simply changed the nets. While they physically left their earthly nets, they exchanged their earthly nets for spiritual nets. Preacher, what do you mean? Christ, when you look at the 12 apostles, all of them had various occupations, backgrounds, and different contexts. You look at Paul. Paul was a politician. He was heavily involved in government. Uh, you know that prior to him becoming Paul, he was a member of the, uh, the Sanhedrin Council. You'll find that the Apostle Luke, uh, prior to his call, he was a physician. He was a doctor. Uh, you look at uh, the Apostle Matthew, the book that we are even in right now, Matthew, prior to his call, he was a tax collector. So he was, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, financially astute in the realm of business and finance. And you say, well, when you look at the, all these disciples, it would seem that, you know, one has to ask the question, Christ, why did you call the fishermen first? You, you could have called the doctor. You could have called the politician. Uh, you could have called the, the man over finance. But Christ, why did you start with four fishermen? They're not the most educated. Not the most seasoned. But Christ, why did you call fishermen? And you'll find that when you look at the craft and the act of fishing, there are uh, similarities that one has of fishing for fish that are necessary also when you're fishing for men. Uh, if, you, if you've been fishing at any point in time, when you cast that net, the fish doesn't always bite immediately. And so we see that the article of patience, the virtue of patience is necessary as a fisherman. And so when you look at and when you compare and contrast being an earthly fisherman to now a fisher of men, when you cast the, the net of Christ and you throw it into the waters, uh, children of God, men and women won't always bite immediately. Some people take some time. You have to be patient with them. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the first lesson in Bible study that you have, they won't bite the word of God. But after uh, several lessons, several sermons of being patient and long-suffering, then after a season of patience, then they'll come and bite. Yeah. Is that all right? Second thing that I noticed when I looked at the, the physical act of fishing is that uh, 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 it takes skill. To be a fisherman. Again, anybody can throw a pole out there and wait. But it takes a special set of skills to catch a fish. Because the fish, even though it can bite the hook, but you can't reel it in fast. You have to be patient man, you and have a certain tact and skill man. when it comes to reeling in the fish. And so just like that earthly fish reeling in souls for Christ, yes, they may bite, but if you try to pull them in too fast, they can fall off the hook. And so it takes a great set of skill. See, the fishermen, they stand in there because they know how to fish. <laughs> I expected some amens from the fishermen. Not only does being a fisherman require patience and skill set along with being a fisherman it requires cooperation it's one thing to catch a fish on your long pole 
But these fishermen, they didn't just fish with poles, but they had what was called nets. And they would cast that net. And every now and again, there would be a catch so great that one man cannot reel the catch in by themselves, but they have to go and call their neighbor and their brother and tell them to come and help us draw in because the catch is too good for us to catch by ourselves. Uh, you recall when the, uh, the fishermen, they had been fishing all night, and Christ told them what? Drop down your net full. A catch Peter told him, Lord, we've been out here fishing all night. Ain't no fish out here. But even though Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, they were crafty at fishing, they were not masters of the sea. The master of the sea knew what was getting ready to happen. And so the one that created the waters and created the fish that dwell in the waters told the fishermen to let down your net for a catch. You know the story. They dropped down the net. Net got so heavy that their boat started to sink, had to call brothers to cooperate. Preach, man. Preach. Come and get the net. Because if you don't help us, our boat is going to sink. So being a fisherman also, it doesn't just require your patience and skill set, but it also requires cooperation with the rest of the family. Is that all right? The last thing that I saw, and there's many other things, but we don't have time for everything. But the last thing that I saw is that being a fisherman, even though you can be, be patient you're willing to cooperate, you have that skill set. But lastly, that I looked at in this text, being a fisherman requires one to have an attractive bait. <laughs> Let him mercy. Uh, there are times, Brother David, you can put a worm on there and, and they'll bite. But then there's times where you got the, the fancy bait that is going to grab and garner the attention of the fish. Sometimes you can have just a worm. Sometimes you can have that special bait. Then there are times you have to have the worm and put a certain odor on the worm and put a certain bait on that hook so that when the children or when the fish come that they don't realize what they're biting into, and that's okay, but they realize that this bait is attractive. There's something about it that makes me want to go and retrieve it. Well, much like it is in the sea, in the realm of the spirit, uh, and I know this is not popular, but the church has to be attractive. Some people don't like that, and that's okay. I've said time and time before that uh, uh, God also cares about how things look. Okay. If you have ever built a home or live in an, a community uh, where you have an HOA, it's called your home on association, uh, there is a responsibility and level of accountability that the HOA gives to the homeowner. Uh, I found that, and I don't own a home, Lord, one day I will. I'm going to claim it. But I've got family that are, are at a higher level than I am, and they, they, they own their homes. They, they live in a, under an HOA. And you can't just have any fence on your yard. You have to have a fence that is, uh, that is in uh, cooperation that follows the same aesthetic as the rest of the community. Not only can you not have any fence that you want, you have to have a certain type of roof on your house. Why? Because you're under the homeowners association. Also, the HOA, they, they will periodically drive through your community and make sure that your grass is always cut. You got to take care of what you own. Am, am I talking to anybody this morning? And so, why? Because the, in order for the HOA to attract more people to buy in that community, they have to ensure that everybody in the community follows the standards of the association. 
And so they create a certain aesthetic. They want a certain attractiveness that is going to lure people in to that community. And preferably, once they lure them in, they now receive further information. And now they once were lured in, but now they want to stay in. Much like the HOA and much like the bait, the church has to be attractive. Now, that word attractive does not mean that we compromise the integrity of God and his word. Because at the core of the church, at the core of this spiritual enterprise, yes, while we want to be attractive, yes, while we want to have a certain aesthetic at the core, if all we have is looks and no substance, when people come in but don't receive any substance, they're going to leave as soon as they came. And so God is a God that uh, not only cares about how things look, but he also is concerned about the message. Because the physical aesthetic much ma must match, rather, the spiritual aesthetic as well. And so we have to be attractive. That's why uh, when money and grace per uh, permits, we take the time to spruce up the building. Uh, that's why we are in phase one of the sanctuary. That's why we've decorated as we are, and it's still work in progress. Uh, this is why, if you look on our year calendar, why we have things that we're planning to do in order to make the church look good, so that when people come, they don't see a building that looks abandoned. But they see an exterior that suggests this is a thriving and vibrant body of people. That you know, when they see it, you know what? I got to see what's going on, because if they, if what's going on on the inside is anything like what's going on on the outside, yeah, I want to see what's going. I, I want to stay around for that. Makes sense. And so, about being a fisherman, but also about being a child of God, we must present ourselves not only as biblically astute and knowledgeable of God and His Word. We must maintain that fellowship, but we must also have a physical aesthetic that is appealing to man. You say, preacher, why that same shallow? How, why is that important? Well, technically it is. When you're calling lost souls who don't know God, they're not going to appreciate the word of God immediately because they're carnal. And so you have to meet people where they are. And if their mind on the early outset is carnal, guess what? You're going to have to meet them physically. Reach them physically. Lure them in with that attractive bait. Get them hooked. And now they're ready to receive not just the milk of the word, but then they'll mature to where they can handle the meat of God's word. Is that all right? Let me be clear. The physical aesthetic means nothing if God's word is not present. Okay. We can also use reverse engineering. Yes, the message of God's word is the most important thing. Amen? It's the most important. But if people are not attracted to the word of God, how can you give them the word? That make sense? And so we see, number one, this occupation, this spiritual enterprise that Christ is calling us to, we not only see that it, it, it will be inconvenient at times, but we also see that it is very important because these men left all that they had and all that they knew and followed. This is not the only case where this happened. Uh, when Christ called Matthew, Matthew was in the tax office. Tax season. He was busy. Christ told him to follow. Matthew left the tax office. Told his coworkers, y'all got it from here. I got another calling now. And so the calling of Christ, this occupation, it will be inconvenient. It's not going to always come in your timing. But we know that when we are called and we are under this hope, we know, as Paul said, all things will work together for the good to what those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Not only his purpose, but according to the good. Not your personal good but the good that God describes and destines for ours. Is that all right? Lesson is yours. Give me the last one, Brother Smith. 
And so we're called to answer the call. You can stand to your feet. We're called to answer the call of Christ. Two things I'll give and I'll let you go. Number one, understand again that God's timing won't always be convenient. Again, we want to remind us that your, your nine to five, your, your, your physical career should not stand in the way of God's spiritual calling on your life. Okay? Secondly, beyond any occupation, the ministry is and should be the top priority. Why is that? Because God knows our earthly obligations. He knows. And because God knows what they are intimately, when you seek him first, as Matthew said in Matthew 6, when you seek ye first what? The kingdom of God and its righteousness and what all of these things. This deals with not only your spiritual needs, but more so your earthly needs and obligations. When you put God first, God will make sure that all of your needs are provided. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Is that all right? Lesson is yours. You're here, member of the body of Christ. You've been lured in by God. You, you've taken the bait. Uh, but maybe you've strayed away. Maybe you've gotten back in the waters of the world, the waters of sin. And you've left this spiritual enterprise. This is the time for restoration. This is the time to return to God. God is waiting for you. And God desires that you come on back home. Not a member of the body of Christ. Uh, you become a member of the Lord's church through the process and act of baptism. That is an outward showing of inward faith. Coming to God just as you are. Know that you're a fish. And God wants you close to him. Uh, the Word of God may not be always attractive. Sometimes it's a hard pill to swallow. We know the serpent, he's also fishing. He also has bait. That's attractive. Look in Genesis 3. When the serpent spoke to the woman, he didn't give her something that she didn't like. The text says when the woman saw that it was desirable and good for food, she took it she ate it and also gave it to her husband. So the serpent, he, he's, he's going to wrap it up just good, just the way you like it. And so we have to consider that's why the outward aesthetic is not the most important. It is important. But if the outward aesthetic does not match the message and the substance of the gift, then you got to reconsider. Come to God as you are. A sinner, desperately in the need of Christ and his salvation. Agree to live for God, put him on in baptism, and puts you in the family of God and gives you access to all that God is and all that God has for you. What's your desire? Come on now, or we sing a song of invitation.